morning, everybody. These are my conflicts of interest to disclose. Well, the heart and the lung are all inside the thorax, so they are obviously interrelated, but if we put it sequentially, the lung, uh, the blood goes to the right heart, then pass through the lung, and few bits later arise to the left hand. And what is the effect of increase intrathoracic pressure in the right heart and in the left heart? So in the right heart, we have a decrease in benefit return and increase in afterload. And oppositely, in the left heart, we have a slight increase in benefit return due to the squeezing of the blood vessels during the inspiration and, and, and a decrease in afterload. But these changes are not constant during all the time. They are cyclic. We are inspirating and expirating all the time. So there is a little delay between what happens on the right side and what occurs on the left side. And this was well represented uh, in the chapter of ESICEM book from Marcelo Mato. Uh, as you can see during the aspiration, there is an increase in venous return of the right ventricle, a decrease during the inspiration, and then there is an increase in left venous return due to the squeezing of the blood vessels of the thorax. And again, in the aspiration, there is an increase in the right ventricle venous return and a decrease in the uh, left ventricle venous return. And it makes cyclic changes in the arterial pressure uh, curve. But if we short the aspiratory time, obviously, we'll let less time to the right ventricle to fill. So the banner return is decreased, and it will be also decreased after some beats to the uh, left heart. So from the hair perspective, maybe one of the main points to discuss would be uh, fluid responsive assessment. And the first question is why we should evaluate fluid responsiveness. So maybe if we try to relate mortality and resuscitation, the curve is something like that. So we don't want our patients to be under-resuscitated because we promote tissue ischemia and may we increase mortality, but we don't want also our patients to be fluid overload because postdoc analysis of ARDS network trials have shown that positive fluid balance has been uh, also associated with higher uh, mortality. So the objective of giving fluids would be maybe to increase stroke volume, which in terms of frank Starling curve means to put our patient from here to the steep point of the curve to the flat point of the curve. And how can we assess where we are of the curve. This is what we are going to discuss now. We will have, or we can have th three different options. The first option is doing nothing, just or flip a coin that Jody tells us yesterday. The second option could be focus on static parameters. And the third option could be to assess dynamic parameters. And what is the real life? And it is extracted from a paper from Mauricio Cecconi, the Fennis study, more than 2,000 patients. Almost the half of the people do nothing. So just give fluids because I look the patient and I think that it may be, he or she may benefit from giving fluids. More than 30% use static ones, and a little bit more than 20% use dynamic parameters. So if you, I, I don't say anything about doing nothing because doing nothing is 
maybe the worst option, but if you focus on the static ones, they are not also good. If you look to the values of the ROC curve of the CVP, all are around 0 0.5 and all are, most of them in different clinical situations are no significant, significant in terms of predicting which patients will respond to fluid challenge. So there are some dynamic parameters that we could uh, evaluate and maybe they will help us to predict which patients will need fluids, which patients will respond to the fluid challenge that it does not necessarily mean that he will need fluids. And these parameters assume or for evaluating these parameters you need that your patient is totally assisted by the ventilator, uh, no muscular effort and no cardiac arrhythmia. And in the, most of the studies, fluid responsiveness has been defined as an increasing cardiac output of stroke volume higher of between 10 and 15%. The first thing that you can do is do it an expiratory occlusion. If you keep the expiration for 15 seconds, it means that you increase the band of return to the right side during 15 seconds and it is transmitted to the left side and you will see an increase, a subsequent increase after the pause in the arterial pressure, which means that when you give volume, the pressure will also increase. And it has a very good accuracy in predicting uh, which patients will uh, respond or not to the fluid uh, administration. Another classical maneuver is the passive leg raising. And in the same study, uh, Xavier Monet compared the diagnostic accuracy of an expiratory uh, pause with passive leg raising, the values were almost, almost the same. But maybe it's also easy just to uh, put the trunk of the patient in the supine position and raise the legs for 50, 45 degrees during 60 or 90 seconds and monitor again cardiac output. In this big meta-analysis, the area under the curve was again over 0 0.9. So it was good in terms of prediction of which patient will respond or not to a fluid challenge. Another option is the pulse pressure variation, which can be uh, easily estimated from the uh, changes in the arterial pressure during the expiration and the inspiration. And also the stroke, sorry, the stroke volume variation that not takes into account the amplitude of the change, but also the area under the curve. Um, different thresholds have been described in the pulse pressure and stroke volume, which are 10 and 13, if I'm not wrong, uh, which are patients over this threshold uh, indicates that may respond to uh, fluid administration. But these parameters need to, to, to be reliable, needs two assumption. One is that mechanical ventilation must create a long and strong enough, but not excessive, change in the pleural pressure to, care, to cause a cyclic decrease in the band of the return to the right heart. And the second assumption is that the, what happens is this, with the cyclic changes in the left ventricle stroke must mainly reflect what has happened in the band of return. So if you are using low tidal ventilation, high respiratory rate of, as we have seen before, you have high interdominal pressure, 
your patient is lightly sedated and maybe there is some effort or you have a right ventricular dysfunction or you have cardiac arrhythmias, these dynamic parameters, SVB and PPV, may not work properly. So one, from the practical point of view, one possible approach could be this one. If you detect some kind of hypoperfusion, you need to assess your patient if it, he is in the preload uh, dependence zone of the Frank Starling curve. He, you may ask yourself if your patient is spontaneous really breathing, if he has cardiac arrhythmias, low tidal volume, high abdominal pressure. In case of not, you can use both of these, all of these parameters. In case of yes, we will see later. Because what happened in non-mechanically ventilated patients? We have only two options and we, maybe three, let's see. One is the passive leg raising and the other one is the inexpiratory occlusion. But if you have a patient on high flow with 50 liters and this X-ray with an SF ratio of 200 and you ask him to make an inexpiratory pause of 15 seconds, maybe you are, I, I, I would not do it <laughs> anyway. So the question is, can I took this patient and put it the trunk supine and then raise him or her legs? I honestly, at the beginning, I was not sure that it works, but my boss said, you should try it. But I say, okay, I will try it, but I have any alternative apart from that. And because during high flow, there are also swings which are not so high uh, compared with mechanical ventilated patients, but there are also swings. I thought, and in my unit, patients are, as you have seen before, completely managed or high flow patients are completely mostly managed non-invasively with no arterial line and no other catheter and just a pulse oximeter, I thought that, and because of, we have seen similar changes in terms of preload, which are flow dependent uh, in patients with high flow, we thought that maybe uh, platysmographic variability index may help us to uh, the, assess the fluid responsiveness in high flow patients. So we designed a very little proof of concept study with the objective of knowing if passive leg raising was feasible and predict as well as PVI, the fluid responsiveness in high flow patients. And we include respiratory stable patients with high flow, with anything of hyperperfusion, we exclude obviously all the criteria that you can obviously uh, imagine. This was the design of the study. We measured the cardiac output by ETT and the PVI. We tried to do the passive leg raising. If, it, if we could do it, we measure it again. And then if we had an increase of less than 10% in the cardiac output, we give no fluids, but if we have uh, higher of 10%, we give 250 ml of uh, saline and then measure again uh, the, sorry, the cardiac output and the PVI. And in case that we could not do the passive leg, leg raising maneuver, we decided to give a fluid and see what happens. We include five patients with 50 liters per minute of flow rate, FiO2 of 0 0.6, little bit lactate, and three were with norepinephrine. And surprisingly for me, not surprisingly, because they were not too sick, they were respiratory stable, 
uh, all patients tolerated 60 or 90 seconds of passive leg raising, and it is what happens with cardiac output. We clearly could divide which patients will respond there is an increase in cardiac output and which patients remain stable. And this clearly correlated with a decrease in the PVI and uh, in which patients who respond. Moreover, the baseline levels of PVI in responders were higher compared with those patients who do not respond. Uh, so in responses, we, we, we give fluids and we have the same uh, results that we have with passive leg raising and okay not all the patients would need fluids but when we measure lactate levels before and after the fluid challenge it seems that the levels of lactate also decrease so we are at some point improving tissue perfusion but as we said before do we need to give fluids to all patients who are responders so my the question is probably not. And it comes again from the question that Dr. Jujopoulos made yesterday about uh, subphenotypes of ARDS. They were previously described in the ARMA and the Alveola trial, Alveoli trial. This is the validation of what they observed is the FAC core trial. This is a class Latin model analysis which represent in the X, in the X axis all the variables and the longer the distance from the black line, the higher difference in the uh, variable measure in the X axis. So, so phenotype two were highly inflammated and had low levels of bicarbonate. And it was important because these patients had a extremely high mortality compared with non-inflammated patients, but more importantly, respond completely different to the fluid administration. If you give fluids to a highly inflammated patients, uh, you will increase mortality. So highly inflammated patients will benefit from a conservative strategy of fluids, but oppositely, non-inflammated patients uh, will not benefit from a conservative strategy in terms of giving fluids. In fact, mortality may even be higher. So they try to develop different models to predict uh, in which phenotype you are using three, four, and five different variables uh, and they uh, they um, validate in the three courts. And another important point is that the patient who is in subphenotype one remains in subphenotype one during the first at least three days. So if you are in the one, you will not, it's unlikely that you will move to the two. So the treatment should be more or less the same and you can be confident on that. From the length perspective, uh, the impact of pressure, positive pressure on vascular compartment is clearly shown. We will have a pulmonary artery hypertension and increased vascular resistance and right ventricular failure, which are all common in ARDS because ARDS and ventilator in this lung injury are uh, very uh, linked. And pulmonary vascular dysfunction in ARDS was introduced more than 40 years ago and it is mainly defined as an increase in pulmonary arterial pressure or uh, pulmonary vascular resistance resulting in a different degrees of right ventricular dysfunction. It has many, many cows in ARDS that may facilitate uh, the operation of pulmonary vascular dysfunction. If we talk in terms of incidence and we focus only on the more severe uh, degree of pulmonary uh, vascular dysfunction, which is acute, acute, acute core pulmonality defined by these two variables in the TTE, 
the incidence has been around 20%. And if we talk about more severe form, the incidence is 7%. The group of Armand Meconzo Desa developed uh, a risk score that was uh, not only described, but also validated to predict the uh, proportion of patients at risk of developing acute core uh, pulmonale. And can we do something in terms of mechanical ventilation to prevent that? Probably yes. And in fact, the, the, the incidence has decreased over the years as we have improved our mechanical ventilation. And I will also, because Fernando is in the room, the moderate PEEP. Moderate PEEP uh, to protect right ventricular dysfunction could be good, but if you could open the lung, maybe it's better to have a high PEEP that will decrease pulmonary vascular resistance and pulmonary arterial pressure, and then the right ventricle will be uh, more happy. He represented very well what we can do in terms of intervention according to the degree of pulmonary vascular dysfunction, and I encourage you to read the, the excellent, uh, this excellent review. In terms of hemodynamics, uh, there's another review uh, published in intensive care that should be read for everyone that provides a useful algorithm uh, to know if you have to give fluids or not. I will pass on that. But, sorry. But uh, to have a very well-trained ventricle may not be also good. If you increase cardiac output, you may also increase shun. We describe it in lung transplant patient using a speckle tracking echo where uh, right ventricular function was the only variable associated to uh, uh, higher incidence of primary graft dysfunction. This was recently nicely shown by the group of Luciano Gattinoni where they occlude the left artery, the left lower lobe artery, and they increase the cardiac output on the other side. So uh, they observe an increase in the edema and it brings us to measure lung perfusion. And thanks to Marcelo Amato and people of Timple, we can do it now at the bedside. This is a patient with ARDS and mainly affected the left lower lobe. I'm sorry because I couldn't extract the images from the device but due to technical problems, but for the ones that you cannot see very well, 80% of the perfusion is on the bottom, on the dependent, and 20% only uh, on the ventral zone. So if you prone the patient, what happens? So we have done it sometimes, and after 16 hours of session of prone, mainly perfusion is still on the back. I, I prone also the images, just to don't have to do it with your brain, but the the, the perfusion is still in the back, but the ventilation is uh, more homogeneous. And finally, one another reason, if you have a, a pleural pressure, uh, a esophageal pressure catheter, another reason or another thing that you can measure is transmural vascular pulmonary pressure. This is extracted from the review from Tommaso. Uh, if you have an increase of pleural pressure due to an active expiration or an increase in PEEP on intrinsic PEEP, you may uh, fail on estimate transmural pressure. For instance, if you have a PVC of 20 and cardiac output of 2, you may say maybe the patient needs inotrope of diuretics. But if I say that your pleural pressure is 20 and then your transformer vascular pressure is zero, maybe you will give fluid. So different uh, approach, uh, different treatments, knowing only one parameter. This slide was uh, explained yesterday by Itakeshi, another way 
to explain is if you keep constant transpulmonary pressure and intravascular pressure and you add an spontaneous breathing, uh, spontaneous breathing, pleural pressure becomes negative and you move from 5 to 25 your transvascular pressure, making more fluid goes to the interstitium. And it has been also shown that another mechanism of Billy is the repeated occlusion or decrease and increase in the flow during inspiration and expiration. And just for the end, um, three slides. Uh, I, I know that I'm out of time, but I will be quickly. During mechanical ventilation, what happens is that Imagine that this is the heart on the oxygenation, this is the reservoir, so the, the, the pleural pressure increase. So the left ventricle afterload decrease and the banner return also decrease because there is an increase in pleural pressure and these tubes are compressible, so it's more difficult to arrive to the pump. If you extubate your patient, the pleural pressure immediately decrease. So, there is a sudden increase in left ventricle afterload and a sudden increase in venous return. And if you don't stop that, or the patient cannot afford this increase in hemodynamic uh, performance, he will start to breathe more deeply and decrease even more the pleural pressure, and it will make increase even more the left ventricle afterload and the banner return, and then you will get on a vicious circle that will make you to reintubate the patient. So, and this is one of the mechanisms that has been shown in these three different patient uh, population was that were independently of the fluid balance previous to the extubation, and it could be at least partially explaining by the phenomenon of ventricular interdependence. If you decrease pleural pressure, you sudden increase of venous return, you push your septum to the left side, so you increase the end diastolic pressure of the left ventricle, which transmits to the capillary pulmonary uh, vessels, and then the edema uh, appears. And can we do something? So if you have cardiogenic pulmonary edema or high-risk patients, maybe NIV would be the best options. But if you want to prevent that, maybe one of the possible options could be high flow, which could be one, at least one of the explanations because high flow performs better in terms of preventive respiratory failure and reintubation in low-risk patients. So to conclude, we, are, we have not in terms of heart and lung interactions, but also in terms of acute respiratory physiology, a very complex Rubicup. Maybe we have to start to put it all together and talking about physiolomics to try to resolve the uh, Rubicube, but what we do in the clinical practice is what I guess Dr. Antonelli will explain later. We, we will personalize as much as we can the treatment. We measure esophageal pressure, we do echo, we do EIT, we measure as much as we can to understand what's happening at every time to all patients. Thank you very much.